Well, there we are, Tom. The glass is half full. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I was going to be explosive, but I had a terrible experience yesterday morning in London. Where I was sorry, could you switch your uh, mic on? Sorry, I don't believe in technology. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I had a terrible experience yesterday morning in London, appearing on a show chaired by Andrew Marr, and there was another person on it called Alistair Gray. And Alistair Gray uh, is a well-known Scottish novelist and painter or artist. And I was saying to some of my colleagues, um, Andy Marr tends to go on and on and on and then ask the question. So he asked the question, and Alistair Gray fixes him with his gimlet eye and says, no. And Andy Marr says, well, can you not expatiate a bit more? No. <laughs> and then the next question, you know, the answer to it is yes. And of course, metropolitanism can't stand this. Andrew Marr is currently in intensive care, <laughs> and his two female research assistants are receiving counselling. And because of that, I can't possibly be explosive as I wish to. Uh, the other thing is, I, during the course of this evening, I may have to mention not names, but offices. Is that allowed? Uh, we'd, we'd have to worry about the context, but we, we can certainly the edit The context stuff out. is semi-libelous. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you asked me to be explosive, didn't you? Well, the, the, the film crew uh, anyway, are quite happy to edit you up. I will not mention it in my four minutes or five minutes. Oh. So basically, as the chairman has said, I'm an historian. And therefore, the, the basis of my own trade is evidence. And in thinking about tonight and being aware of the fact that I'm an innocent in the, me the media field, I decided to try and accumulate evidence. I, d I decided to try and find out what those who know the trade better than I do um, are observing. And the two groups I have contacted, which will form the basis of my remarks, are first um, producers, and I haven't gone above producer level, producers, um, senior producers as well, who have spent time in the area that I'm concerned with. My concern tonight is not with broadcasting in general, but specifically with Radio Scotland, which of course has much greater time coverage than any of the other outlets that we've been discussing so far. And the other group are those individuals who very kindly, despite the fact that they are, they are still employed uh, by the BBC, were able to say things to me off the record, knowing that in, under no circumstances, except if news of the world type values are offered to me, would ever give away their names or their addresses. Okay? What I want to do in the two or three minutes I've got is not to complete the story, but to provide you with a taster of what I hope I'll be able to say during the course of the debate, either through the invitation uh, of the, uh, the chair or if questions are asked. Um, because the latter, two, the latter two areas, which I think should go into the meat of the debate, is why things have happened to Radio Scotland over the last 10 years. And most importantly, because I will try to be as positive as I can, what in terms of the professionals should be done to try and resurrect the channel to the position it should be in, as people, people have been implying, has to be in the newly emerging, the newly emerging Scotia. Uh, now, th th there, is one, there is one further point before I begin, and that is there's been much attention paid tonight to resource. The general view of those individuals, and there was about eight or nine of them that I spoke to, is that if there's a division of interest between resource and attention to what should be done, it's the latter which is the more important. This is not to say that Radio Scotland and the Beeb in general in Scotland does not require more resource. Of course it does. Um, and there are some very illuminating comparisons with Radio 4 in terms of protection and particular programmes of the flagship nature on Radio 4, which have been protected over time, um, which I don't know whether your committee dug up this, uh, th this information, because my sense, Joan, was that the BBC representatives, despite the grilling, got away with murder, especially in relation to some of the things I've been learning over the last week or 10 days or so. 
Radio Scotland wins for the second year in succession Station of the Year Award. The controller of Radio Scotland has established such a national international reputation that he is headhunted by Radio 4 to become their next controller. The Scottish press regularly enthuse about Radio Scotland as a vibrant and very relevant station. The Sony Award in, 19, in, in the period I'm talking about, the Sony Award, which is the Radio Oscars, was given to GMS, Good Morning Scotland. Nominations to these awards occurred regularly, or did occur regularly, at that time. Staff morale was high. The station took pride in its status and on the accolades given to it. And again, there was hardly any dissent in the sources that I inquired of. Hardly any dissent about that statement that I've given you. But that statement refers to the 1990s. It does not refer to the year 2012. So we fast forward. A contributor earlier this year in spring to the I Write Festival in a debate more generally about the Scottish condition and about Scottish independence, off the cuff says, BBC Radio Scotland is a national humiliation, cheered to the echo by the packed audience, cheered by Ian McWhirter. Not that he was cheering, he was simply cheering the event. <laughs> because as he's already said, he doesn't agree with Professor Devine on these issues. But very impartially, he chaired uh, that, particular, that particular experience. One senior producer who I particularly respect because of his record said he is phoned weekly by colleagues who are still there wanting to know how to get out. This is not redundancy by coercive financial means. This is redundancy because the morale in that station is so low. I'll come on to some of the specifics of it when we get to the debate stage. There is complete virtual contempt for senior management on the part of those who are actually the foot soldiers and the, if you like, the, 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 um, the officers and the NCO class in that particular, that, in that particular station which, of course, they dared not raise in public fora because they are still employed by the organisation. There is no evidence that I have come across listening to people and also appearing on Radio Scotland that there is anything really wrong, despite the great hemorrhage, there's anything really wrong with the skilled personnel who are front of house, who actually do the business. The problem with Radio Scotland, as I shall discuss if given the opportunity, in the second part of tonight is in another area. And that area is verging on the Aegean stable in terms of the information that's been given to me by people whom I both trust and respect for their professional expertise. This is what one former senior producer says of the kind of programming that he has to listen to, given the number of times he and his colleagues received accolades in the 1990s. Inept pap, which is embarrassing and demeaning. We all know the programmes he's referring to. We dare not mention them, perhaps, but we all know <clears throat> what they are. It's, a, it's an enormous tragedy, ladies and gentlemen, that as many Scottish listeners tune in to the Today programme now as to Good Morning Scotland. According to one source, and I cannot be certain about this, others around the table may know for more certain, like Ewan who does a lot of work for Radio Scotland, is that Good Morning Scotland does not have a dedicated producer anymore. How has a one mighty, once mighty, perhaps not perfect, but an outstanding organisation which existed in the 1990s come to this pass. So there's two analytical issues that need to be discussed, in, at least as far as RS is concerned, 
in the second part of the evening. One is the reasons for decline or relative decline. According to the evidences, and this is not my view, the evidences I've tried to gather. And secondly, what can be done about it? And a number of the points raised by these individuals that I, that I talk to are cogent and doable, even without additional resource. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. But well, that wasn't the explosive part. That wasn't the explosive part, as, as you just said. <laughs> no doubt that will follow. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, the, the rest of the proceedings are over to you. Uh, uh, We're happy to take your questions. Um, try and keep them brief. And if you have a particular panel member you would like to respond to your question, if you would kindly indicate who that might be. Yes, sir. You, you, you need to come up here and use one of the mics, please. Just the, this one here, anyone, in fact. Yep. Hi, my name's Robbie Pennington. This is less of a, a question, more of a plea, perhaps. And it was just to, to ask the panel to remember the roughly 300,000 of us in the south of Scotland who don't have Scottish independent TV, who receive our news and current affairs from Tyne Tees. Uh, and hopefully to ask if you, if you could perhaps address that sometime during the evening. Yeah, yeah Joan would like to, to respond, in fact. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you raised that point. Um, uh, I didn't want to go on beyond the five minutes, but I'm a South of Scotland regional uh, member, and uh, that is a very, very important issue. Um, we, we had a cross-party group, um, not an official cross-party group, but an unofficial cross-party group in the Parliament last year looking at this. Um, and you may be aware that uh, the Department of Culture in London decided not to block the renewal of licences for Channel 3 um, uh, a month ago, um, which means that STV will uh, probably get its licence uh, for Central and North Scotland, but ITV will continue with the coverage in the South of Scotland. Now, Maria Miller, the Culture Secretary in London, who obviously decides these things, uh, did write to Ofcom and say that um, she expected them to look at improving uh, news uh, from Scotland in the South, um, because when we, we brought them before our cross-party group last year, they, they wouldn't even acknowledge that there's a problem with their news coverage in the South of Scotland. Um, what is of great concern to me is I put down a, a motion in Parliament last week and I'm hoping to have a debate on it, so maybe that directly uh, answers your question. What's of concern to me is that um, the cross-party support that I was hoping to get for the motion, uh, given the cross-party group last year, wasn't, um, wasn't what I expected. Patricia Ferguson from Labour has, has signed it and she's the culture spokesman and uh, she'll speak in the debate, but the Conservative and Liberal members, uh, uh, when I last looked, hadn't signed it. Um, and I, I don't understand why that is. And actually, that's why I made the point that I, I hope that this wasn't going to become a political, uh, party <coughs> political issue. Like, you give more Scottish content, it might make people more likely to vote SNP. <laughs> that's, not what this, that's not what this is about. It's about giving people information about their country and, uh, and about their local area as well. And uh, it's, it's a real concern because STV have offered to give their non-news content at cost to ITV. So Scotland Tonight, which we should probably mention is one of the few really good, good things to have happened in Scot <coughs> Scottish broadcasting over the last year, um, is not available to people in the south of uh, Scotland. And that's a really important forum, pitched at a different kind of audience as well, not political anoraks, um, where people can actually get into the debate about you know, things that are uh, decided in this parliament, not just the constitution, but health and, and other things. So um, I'm hoping that we get cross-party support for that debate. And I'll certainly let you know when it's happening, if you want to give me your name and you can, you can tune into it. So it should be sometime in the new year. Because uh, just lastly, I think it's really important to put pressure on uh, Ofcom, who Maria Miller has told to speak to ITV um, to, do, to resolve this issue. Um, um, so that's, we're going to have a couple of months to do that. So the more pressure that we can put on them, not just to have regional news, but to have Scottish uh, content in the south of Scotland is really important. Thanks. Okay. 
No. Yes, sir. <coughs> uh, Peter Curran, I'd like to take up a point that Ian McWhirter made, that he was confident... Please, could you speak into the mic? Even in the event of a, a no vote, uh, there would be considerably more devolution to Scotland, a kind of devo plus, and that, that would include the BBC. Well, given that there's a powerful body of opinion that thinks that uh, devolution is rather in the position of the crofter whose wife was being delivered of multiple births by the light of a candle, for God's sake, but out the candle, it's like it's attracting them, that after a no vote, we would get devo minus. Do you want to respond? To yeah, I mean, I'm not. A, I'm not here as an advocate of devolution plus, devolution minus, or any of the other 57 varieties. I was just stating the observation. I think that um, there will be a bit of a scramble if if Scotland votes no. I'm not prejudging that either. If Scotland votes no in 2014, I think there'll be a scramble to try to toss you know, a few trinkets to the natives, as it were. And what they'll do is try to look at uh, what powers can be other powers. Because all the parties, uh, the, the Prime Minister, um, the Labour Party, have all committed themselves to um, Scotland having more power if Scotland votes no. Now, they may, you know, like Lord Hume, they may be completely cynical about that and uh, may offer a better devolution, which never materialises. But I think in this case, in this situation, I think they can, pressure will be put on them to be a bit more specific about the kind of extra powers the Scottish Parliament will have if we move to this new stage of devolution, which, as I say, all three of the parties uh, have uh, promised. And I think one of the most obvious ones would be broadcasting, because it, it doesn't seem to me to make a great deal of sense to have press regulated by the Scottish Parliament, uh, or potentially regulated independently by the Scottish Parliament, as it is at the moment, and for broadcasting not to be. I think that would be an anomaly which would very quickly be addressed. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Before I invite uh, Pete Murray, just let me say uh, there is a further anomaly heaped upon anomalies here in that the Scotland Act 2012, I understand, and John will no doubt correct me if I have <coughs> misunderstood it, is that in future the BBC Trust Member for Scotland will be a sort of joint appointment by the Scottish Government and the Department of uh, Culture, Media and Sport. Am I right? Yeah, the Scottish Government will have to, um, will have to approve. Um, the, the, they'll check with the Scottish Government, but how the mechanism will actually work, um, we're not absolutely sure. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it has to be run past the Scottish Government. But, so therefore the member for Scotland would be run past the Scottish Government, but that wouldn't apply to the member for Northern Ireland, it wouldn't apply to the member for Wales, it wouldn't apply to any of the other members of the BBC Trust. So it is, as Ian says, you know, you know, well, it seems to me it's another anomaly. Um, if I can introduce uh, uh, Pete Murray from the National uh, Union of Journalists, uh, have I titled you correctly, uh, Pete? I think you wanted to comment on the last point. Yeah, thanks very much, John, and thanks for the, for the invitation to speak. It, it's partly on the last point, but also um, I was very interested in what uh, Professor Devine was saying and how he'd spoken to a number of people before coming to the, to the meeting this evening. A couple of weeks ago, before I spoke to the Education and Culture Committee, I did much the same, went through much the same process. I was speaking to some of my ex-colleagues at the BBC, getting their views as a journalist and as a trade unionist. But as a journalist, I, I investigated, spoke to people, made some notes about it. Um, and the BBC responded to what I said before the committee by saying that they didn't recognise um, my description of, of what was going on inside the BBC, but that may reflect the people that I'd been speaking to. And so I, I wonder whether Tom may get the same kind of reaction to, um, to what he's saying this evening um, to, his, to his comments. I think the BBC uh, management here in Scotland are being particularly blinkered in, in what, they, what they see. They think of themselves as taking a correct course of action here. The public seems to disagree with them. The, the trade unions certainly disagree with them. And it looks like Lord Patton now disagrees with them as well because he's told them to come before the committee in this room and respond to what, we, to, to what the NUJ and others have been saying about the state of, of the BBC Scotland. Um, I certainly agree. I, I go back with, in, in BBC Scotland to that vintage era, if you like. I mean, it was never a vintage era. It's very dangerous to look back on a lot yeah, of these periods like as being age, a, a, a golden right, age or anything like that. It certainly yeah. wasn't that, but it certainly was much a much easier environment to work in than it is now. And from our point of view in the National Union of Journalists, we'd absolutely 
I think Joan very much nailed the, the, the problem that it, it's not, I agree with Tom to some extent that it's not just about finance, but the financing of the news gathering operation, the less money there is around, the fewer people there are around, then the less diverse the news gathering operation becomes. And that's a great, great danger. And Kate also mentioned it as well. And so I think when it comes to the future of the BBC, whether it's under independence or, or in, under some sort of Devo Max um, operation, that um, it's, it's an issue that the BBC nationally ha would have to address um, about opening themselves up to, to a more diverse audience. I think the, 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 the kind of parameters, the vision of, of BBC Scotland has very definitely shrunk. And, and that may be a, a reflection of the staff, um, the, the, the area that the staff are gathered from. The, the NUJ certainly has concerns about the shrinking catchment area of journalism generally. Um, and I think that's also reflected in Scotland. And so that's something that the BBC would have to address anyway, and does have to address it anyway. But I think looking at, again, taking, going back to what Kate said, let's look at the glass being half full rather than half empty. At the moment, because of the referendum debate and the, the wider political debate that's going to be happening over the next two, two and a half years or so, and also because of the, the Leveson report and the, some of the issues that Leveson raises for, um, as Ian mentioned, um, regulation of the BBC and of the Scottish media more widely, I think, I hope, there is a chance to have a look at some of these issues in a more general format. I think from the NUJ's point of view, for a long, long time, we've been calling for a, a Scottish media commission and for wider Scottish um, regulation of, of the media. Um, and I think I agree with Ian that it is almost certain that broadcasting will come under the the, the auspices directly of the Scottish Parliament, we would certainly welcome that. But I think the, the regulatory system in Scotland, whether it's under independence or Devo Max, will have to address some of these wider issues that, that Kate was looking at, which have to do with the fact that tr the traditional media are no longer the only area that needs to be regulated and looked at. And so the, uh, I think it would, we would certainly welcome a wider um, spectrum for, the, uh, for, for, for whatever method of regulation exists um, after 2014 and into 2015. I think there are a lot more issues that, that, at stake. And also, but also, crucially, financing of all of that is, is one of the big issues for us. And so the, a wider look at the licence fee and about how the press is funded in Scotland would, would certainly be um, worthwhile looking at. I think one of the other issues that John asked me to, to look at was, was what other trade unions are saying in Scotland about the, the devolution debate and so on. I'll be very, very brief about this because I don't want to dominate anything at all here. But I think that it's, it's interesting how a lot of the trade unions in Scotland, whether they're the PCS or private sector trade unions, they're all, a number of the trade unions are now looking very seriously at what the future for, for organised workers will be in Scotland in the lead up to, to the, the referendum and thereafter. I think the only, the only area that we can agree on, I hope, is that we should start this debate from the point of that social justice, equality and rights at work should be paramount as part of that debate. Um, and the other trade unions are beginning to look at that. We can no longer take it for granted that the trade unions, because there are many of the trade unions are affiliated to the Labour Party, that they will therefore support the no campaign. That's no longer a given. And the STUC, for example, the umbrella body for all the trade unions, is now saying, don't take any of that for granted. And we will have to look um, to see whether we can end, whether we can um, foster a, a wider debate in the trade union movement. I think it is beginning to happen. And uh, the, it's, it's a much more open field, I think, for that debate. Good. Thanks very much, Pete. Can, can Sorry, I just yes, uh, make a few comments? Thank you very much for, for, for that. It's very interesting. So we've been both down the same track probably talking to some of the same people. Um, the, the other thing I was going to add was, in addition to what your recipe is, can I just give some of the points that I think, given the limited investigation that I undertook, would um, help to assist the situation of improvement? The, like everybody who said this, the, um, I think uh, broadcasting is likely to be devolved, but it, that won't change anything. What, what will have to go along with that are other parallel developments. Um, the, the, the developments are going to be, how do we get senior management in the BBC in Scotland to listen? Uh, because the track record so far is that they don't listen very easily. I'll give you an example of this. The night before Pacific Key was opened, 
um, a number of Scots, ten of us in all, were invited to dinner with what was then called the BBC, um, I'm confused now, is it, it's now trustees, is it? The governors, the governors. It's the BBC Trust. It's BBC Trust now, but then I think it maybe have a different name. And, and uh, because the BBC were hosting the dinner, there was a lot of politeness around until with the conspicuous absence of two university vice chancellors, both female, who were obviously attempting to, you know, to develop a deal for some for a number of reasons, maybe courses, etc., with the BBC. For two hours, the senior management of BBC Scotland and all the trustees or governors had to listen to a sustained attack from virtually everybody around that table. And they were talking about people who, like the director of the Edinburgh International Festival, the, 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 the Vicky Featherstone who's about to go to, you know, leave the National Theatre, and, and a number of other people who had no reason to be like that. But what effect did it have? Zero. Zero effect. And the same sort of points that some of us might be able to come up with tonight um, were being said at that stage. So how do you do that? That's, that's, that's the, the first point. <coughs> Second thing from my investigation, I don't know whether it, it, um, is, um, it's also supported by yours, an urgent need for a new head of radio, a true leader who can develop the station and also stand up for it, a management structure which includes a radio representative at current affairs level, also allied with ed editors who are willing to battle for resources, <coughs> and not simply accept what London wants. And then the resource thing, you're, you're right, obviously the resource issue is, it's not simply about approach, it's not simply about how things are done, although certainly my contact suggests that's the vital thing, rather than resource. You're not going to get more money out of the, 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 the BBC generally, but I would have thought that the Scottish Parliament in particular, after the, the devolution of broadcasting, could ask at least for a period of budgetary protection so that, and I'm thinking specifically now about Radio Scotland, so that there would be a period of time given to, given to it to recover, to recover and move towards, not the golden age of the 1990s, but at least a degree of improvement. The other thing is the audience council should be scrapped. Its comments are cosmetic. They do not deal with the major issues that some of us at least are talking about tonight. They do critique, they do have criticisms, but if you look at their, their national reports, uh, their annual and national reports, what they have to say is, um, is of arcane, semi-relevant value. And who are they? Where are the big beasts, if you want to use that term again, of the, the Scottish nation who should be on it? And don't forget, they are appointed by the Beeb. Oh. These, these are good points, Tom. I haven't Let's... finished. There's one other thing I wanted okay, to yeah. say. Just, which just is... one more, then, before yeah, we move There's on. two things which have come up tonight. I like the comparative perspective. Small nations learn best by seeing all aspects of, of their activities in comparative perspective. And we've had delicious examples. We're all hooked on Scandinavian criminality. <laughs> Apart from Ian Rankin, by the way, who regards it as a rival competitor. <laughs> um, and, and the final thing is, it would be wonderful to see programmes made in Scotland, but not about Scotland, which sell across the world. Yeah.